Muy buenas tardes, amados amigos, hermanos presentes. Good afternoon, beloved friends and brethren present, and those who are in different countries, ministers, and churches. May the blessings of Christ, the angel of the covenant, be upon all of you and also upon me. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. For this occasion, we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 to 8, and chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. It says, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. And verses 14 to 15 tells us, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it all. And God doeth it all that man should fear before him. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that which is past. All things under heaven have their time. That is our subject for this occasion. You may be seated if you're so kind. In the divine program, we find that a time has been established for everything. A time to work and a time to rest, to sleep. A time to eat, and then a time to digest what was eaten and obtain strength to work, to live, a time to be born, and then a time to die. At the time to be born, the boy cries, or the baby girl cries, but their parents and family members laugh. And then, at the time to die, if it's a believer, the family members cry, but the one who goes with Christ laughs and enjoys his or her stay in paradise until the resurrection takes place. There is time for everything, a time to sow and a time to reap. At the time to sow, it takes a lot of work and it's a long season. But later comes a harvest time and then comes the joy, the happiness of the sower. That his harvest has been good and this fills the one who did the sowing with joy. That is why in the Bible it talks about the happiness, the joy of the harvest. Because if the harvest isn't good, then the one who sowed doesn't rejoice that he sowed. He doesn't rejoice that he worked because the result wasn't positive. And now, notice how the Bible shows us that for everything, 
Under heaven, there is a time. It has a time. The scripture tells us what we read a few moments ago. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. For example, the twelfth hour, the twelfth hour to the sixth hour of yesterday passed, but today we're back in that cycle again. See? Each day restores the hours. Each day restores the days of the week and the days of the month are restored and the weeks are restored, the months and so forth of the year. And the year is completed and then comes another year. See? That is a restoration of something that already passed. And what will come well, that is already what is being lived. It will come back, but in a new cycle. That is why those cycles have been named by number. The numbers of the hours, they used to be called watches. And the days have also been named to differentiate each day and the months have been named, and so on, and the years have also been numbered. But we can see that everything is a restoration of something that already happened. It comes back and cycles gets fulfilled. And it is very important to know that the cycle in which one is living. If you think that you're living on a Wednesday morning, instead of coming to church, you go to work. Or if you think it's Sunday, you sleep in or you come out to church when you were supposed to go to work. And that shows that you're not well. You're forgetting things. And the person may reach a time where he gets very unwell and forgets things, forgets the cycles, the day he is in, the month he is in, the year he is in, and he forgets the things he has to do in each time. He forgets the time, the moment he is living in. And that is how it is in the spiritual And now, in the days of Jesus, past cycles were being repeated. And then, they asked Jesus for a sign. And Jesus tells them in chapter 16 of St. Matthew the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, 
It will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but ye cannot discern the sign of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Now he didn't tell them. He didn't explain the sign to them. In another one of the Gospels, he explains it. Let's see in St. Luke. Chapter 11, verse 29 and on, it says, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, but there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. And now, in St. Matthew, chapter 12, verse 40, let's see what it tells us there. It tells us there that they will be given no sign but the sign of Jonah. That as Jonah was in, in the whale's belly for three days, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And that is saying that Jonah being in the whale's belly for three days and three nights is representing Christ dying, being buried, and being in the heart of the earth for three days. It was a time parallel to Jonah's time. And that is how it has been happening on different occasions. Now the case of the case of Jesus speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees there 
about the sign of Jonah, he also speaks to them about the signs of the heavens and shows them that when they see the cloud rising out of the west, they say, the rain is coming. The cloud rising out of the west. And this shows us that there is something important that will happen in the West. When a cloud rises out of the West, Christ says that they say, a shower is coming, the rain is coming. When Elijah declared around chapter 17 to 18 of 1 Kings that there would not be rain upon the earth, but according to his word, that was a very big declaration. Chapter 17 of 1 Kings, verse 1 says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain this years, but according to my word. And he didn't say for how many years, and the rain stopped. The skies then were like brass, divine judgment. They didn't know when the rain would come back, but they could indeed know there will not be rain, but according to my word. The physical rain represents the spiritual rain, the shower of blessing, the former rain and the latter rain, the rain of the word of God revealed for the people. The gospel of Christ as the former rain, the gospel of grace, and the gospel of the kingdom as the latter rain. Both revolve around the coming of the Lord. The former rain around the first coming of Christ and the latter rain around the second coming of Christ. And until Elijah prayed back then, he tells Ahab there in chapter 18 after a great demonstration of the manifestation of God after Elijah restored the place to make sacrifices there. Elijah restored everything there because the altar was ruined. He gathered the stones, 12 stones, which represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Elijah restoring the altar upon which the fire would fall where they make or where they put the sacrifice, where the sacrifice was carried out, that is God through Elijah restoring Israel for the divine fire to come down, the pillar of fire returning to Israel. There will be a great manifestation in the midst of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, of God's power, and then Israel 
will have their part for which Israel must be restored, the 12 tribes of Israel, which is represented in the 12,000 people, 12,000 of each tribe of the sons of Israel. And then Elijah says to Ahab, Go, get up. And Elijah said unto Ahab, This was after God's power was manifested. And then he killed, he slew the false prophets, 450 of Baal and 400 of the groves. And after that, rain rain would come upon Israel. Notice why the reason for the requirement of the restoration of the 12 tribes of the two sticks joined together in the hand of God for the restoration of the 12 tribes and therefore also the restoration of the kingdom of God which on earth is the kingdom of David. It is important to know these things. Notice, there are 450 prophets of Baal that agreed with the king and the king with them, but God did not agree with them. Those were lying prophecies given to the king. But there was a prophet, there was a genuine prophet, Elijah, who wouldn't sell out. Even if it cost him his life, he would prophesy what God told him. It is important to know that Elijah then tells him, chapter 18, verse 41, and on. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. And the skies had no clouds, but Elijah was hearing them in another dimension. He is seeing what God is going to do, and for it to be done, Elijah has to speak it. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And he cast himself down on the earth, and he put his face between his knees and said to his servant, Go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. There were no clouds because in order for it to rain, clouds must appear. Those are the ones that are filled with water. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode 
and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. An abundance of rain. Elijah was asking for it where? On Mount Carmel, praying and sending his servant to look toward where? Toward the west. Because remember that from the land of Israel and from Mount Carmel, in order to look toward the sea, one has to look towards the west. And... The cloud that rises out of the sea, the sea represents nations, peoples, and tongues. And he looks towards the west, towards a great sea. Now remember that Reverend William Branham, forerunner of the second coming of Christ, and the spirit and power of Elijah, but if I said for the fourth time, said that there have been two showdowns and the third one is a Mount Zion. That the third one is a Mount Zion. The first one on Mount Carmel was with Elijah. The second was a Mount Transfiguration with Jesus and Moses and Elijah beside him, one on each side, and the third showdown is a Mount Zion which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there is the literal Mount Zion there in Israel, and there's the spiritual Mount Zion, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is also the heavenly Jerusalem. But in the typology under the New Covenant, Mount Zion is always the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which St. Paul the Apostle speaks to us about in chapter 12, verse 8, chapter 12, verse 18 of Hebrews. From there on, he says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched. In other words, you did not come, you have not come to Mount Sinai, and that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest. When God was giving the law to Moses, the mountain was on fire. There was a tempest. There was a thunder there. The trumpet was sounding long. There was also darkness. For the light shines in the darkness and upon the darkness. And the darkness was thick, but the fire of God, the presence of God, the pillar of fire, was there where Moses was. And the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned and thrust th through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake, for ye are come unto Mount Zion, and into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. We have come to the spiritual Mount Zion, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have the literal mountain, which is there in Jerusalem, where there are great blessings for Israel. We have to see what the types and figures are and see that there is a great blessing 
both for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and for the Hebrew people. Therefore, we pray for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we also pray for the Hebrew people. They are our brethren. In Revelation chapter 14, it speaks to us. It speaks to us about Mount Zion, it says. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. There, notice, it says, And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard a voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now notice how in Mount Zion there will be 144,000 that follow the Lamb. In the spiritual sense, Mount Zion is the church in the literal sense, it is a mountain there in Jerusalem. We are at a time in which we have to see and understand, know which are the signs that are in the scriptures that will be indicating the time of the end, the time to complete the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and to receive the faith to be changed and taken with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Therefore, we cannot ignore the signs of the times. Christ himself says that the people of that time did not know the time that we're living in. They ignored the signs indicating that that was the messianic time, the time for the coming of the Messiah. And therefore, it was fulfilled and they did not know it. He said, Matthew 16, 2, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the sign of the times? We have seen how important it is to know the signs of the times in order to recognize the time in which one is living. If we don't recognize the signs of the times, we will miss what God will be doing 
and the time in which we have been given to live. Chapter 12, verses 54 to 56 of St. Luke says, And he said also to the people, When you see a cloud rise out of the west, that is the west. And where are we? In the west. Therefore, we get to see that sign. The cloud of water, the cloud of the rain of the gospel of the kingdom of the latter rain rising out of the west, out of the continent of the Americas, especially out of the part of Latin America and the Caribbean. The sea represents peoples, nations, and tongues. The literal sea, well, that is the one with water. And now, the cloud of spiritual water of latter rain will rise out of where? Out of the west. As the lighting comes out of the east, the land of Israel, and shines where? In the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Therefore, what the fourth Elijah announced would happen and the signs it gave, just as Christ also gave them, will be fulfilled in the west, in the spiritual Mount Zion, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And from there, it will go on to the east, just like the sun goes from the west to the east. And the sun that is seen in the evening after sunset, which can be from 5 to 6 in the afternoon, or from 5 to 8, depending on the season, if it's summer or winter, is the same sun that will rise in the east. Therefore, the first ones who have the blessedness, the blessing of seeing the sun that will rise in the east, what is Israel waiting for? The coming of the Lord. It will be seen by the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the west because the coming of the Son of Man will shine in the west as the lightning comes out of the east and shines where? In the west. So, we are going to see what will happen in Israel in advance. Elijah looked and sent his servant to look. Go and look toward the sea, that is, toward the west, which is where the Mediterranean Sea is. That is why Reverend William Brenham says that Revelation chapter 10 is the coming of the mighty angel of the Lord of the angel of the covenant and he says that it is the messenger to Israel. The angel of the covenant is always the messenger to Israel. The one who gave them the covenant there on Mount Sinai and then gave the new covenant, established a new covenant there on the mountain in Jerusalem. On Calvary's cross, he shed the blood of the new covenant. In the last supper that he had with his disciples, around Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 to 29, he says, This is the blood of my New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And now, just as the sun starts its journey in the east, and finishes it in the West, the time to shine upon the day ends. The day of the dispensation of grace began shining there in Israel in the East, the Middle East. And the Son of Righteousness will finish his journey where? In the West, 
As simple as that. El sol representa la luna representa la iglesia. The sun represents Christ. The moon represents the church too. And Mount Zion represents also the church. And now, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, says St. Paul in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 to 27. And in Isaiah, it says the Deliverer will come to Zion, chapter 59, verse 20 of Isaiah. Now we can see that the spiritual Zion is one thing and the literal Zion is another thing. And there's a spiritual Jerusalem, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior who will change our bodies. Who shall change our bodies. He will change our body that he may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. That is what St. Paul speaks to us about in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. He shall change our vile body, because in these bodies, as princes and princesses of the kingdom of heaven, which Christ says in Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 5 and chapter 20 of Revelation, that they are, that he has cleansed us with his blood, he has redeemed us with his blood, and has made us kings and priests unto our God. And St. Paul also says, Judges. And Revelation chapter 20 says, They will judge as well those who are given power to judge. Therefore, we can see that just as a prince or a princess of a certain country where monarchy where monarchy is still in effect, even if it's the way some countries have it, where they're kings, but they don't rule, rather the government that they established, that was established, a democratic government is the one with the political authority. Notice, but if you see the children of royalty dressed raggedly they are degrading they are dressed degraded for the position they are entitled to as princes and princesses and if you see them doing certain things they're not supposed to do they are also doing wrong and God's sons and daughters are on earth immortal, temporary bodies. And therefore, they were born one day to die another day until our transformation takes place and we no longer see death and those who died are raised in glorified bodies. And that is also a promise for the time in which we're seeing the signs pertaining to this end time. Signs in heaven and in earth too. And on earth, both in the environment as well as in the spiritual, religious, and political world. All things under heaven have their time. We must recognize the time in which we have been given to live, recognize the signs that pertain to our time, and hold on tight to the angel of the covenant, to Jesus Christ, because whoever lets go of Christ and turns away from Christ has turned away from the new covenant and the blood of Christ is no longer effective for him. He is left under a curse. Therefore, it is important to recognize the signs 
of the time in which we have been given to live. For this time in which we're living, there is a promise that he will send Elijah as a forerunner of his second coming, and he already sent him, and he has already gone. It is already history. But we have the promise that the ministry of Elijah will be repeated for the fifth time, and that will be a great sign for all human beings, for Christianity too, as well as for the Jews who are waiting for Elijah, who foreruns the coming of the Lord for them and will announce everlasting peace. Therefore, he comes with a message in which he will be speaking of the everlasting peace. And the everlasting peace is in the context of the kingdom of the Messiah. He cannot come speaking of the everlasting peace which can be obtained by international treaties. No, the everlasting peace will be brought by the Messiah, the Prince, and his kingdom. Outside of that, they may be peace treaties for temporary peace, of which St. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 and on, when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them, and they will not escape, as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. That is what will happen during the time of the Great Tribulation. They're trying with different political and religious leaders to bring temporary peace, which is not bad, because until the perfect peace comes, having peace, even if it's temporary, is good so that our children are at peace and people can go to work in peace and so forth. But during that time in which that temporary peace will take place, suddenly a great conflict will unleash a military as well as political as well as diplomatic conflict and also in the environment and nature. Those will be the divine judgments that will fall upon the human race during the Great Tribulation. Therefore, we must recognize the signs pertaining to this end time and what they will be indicating at this time in which we're living. Because if not, they will go over our heads without us realizing what is happening at this end time. Notice back then, with the Messiah among them, they did not recognize him except for some who realized it by divine revelation. Flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, Christ says to St. Peter, but my Father which is in heaven. It is by divine revelation which comes down directly from God to the person's heart his soul through the message relevant to the time in which a person is living and he wakes up to reality. Awake thou that sleepest and arise from among the dead and Christ shall give thee light. For the spiritually dead, the dead to eternal life, to resurrect to eternal life by receiving Christ as Savior and being born again of water of the Spirit. They are born to eternal life. They are restored to spiritual eternal life first, and then in the resurrection and transformation of the living to the physical eternal life that he has promised for all his believers. Therefore, let's not lose sight of the signs of the times. We have earthquakes, sea quakes, or tsunamis, volcanoes, all of that is prophesied. Reverend William Branham said on page 429 of the book of an exposition of the church ages of the book of Revelation 7 seals, page 429, he says that when we see earthquakes happening like this, a lot of earthquakes, 
one here, another there, consecutively, to remember that such will be the time for the resurrection of the believers who have departed, and therefore for the transformation of us who are alive. It is important to be awake to reality. Let's be awake to the reality of the time in which we have been given to live, awake to the promises there are, and awake to see those promises being fulfilled, each one gradually in due time, because there is a time for all things, and therefore there is a time appointed by God himself for the things of God. All things under heaven have their time. And you and I, in order to come to earth, had the time appointed by God. We didn't come at a time in which we wished to live on earth because we did not have the opportunity to choose. That was God's choice. Thank God that he chose for us to live at this time, the time of the great promises and the great signs to receive all the divine blessings and reach the resurrection of the dead and the transformation of the living. May the blessings of Christ, the angel of the covenant, be upon each one of you and also upon me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will leave with you Reverend Porfirio Ramon Tijevia, present here, and in each country, the relevant minister. God bless you and keep you all.